everybody and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program on this June 1st, um, really starting into the summertime heat now, but it's also a great time for the pollinators to be out and about. So we're going to have a class today on a pollinator plant starter kit. And what that basically means is um, plants that are easy to find and you know easy to start. We're going to break this up into little chunks because sometimes we get overwhelmed and you know we think I can't have you know my butterfly garden, my pollinator garden because it's too much work. But if all of us just did a little bit of work, just a little, you know, just made one little bed in our yard, a pollinator bed, if everybody did that, that is going to be very beneficial to, you know, the entire ecosystem. So I'm including some steps that are easy for you to do to prepare, as well as plants that are fairly easy to find, because I know a lot of times especially native plant enthusiasts, we actually enjoy the hunt of, uh, you know, finding these native plants. That's part of the fun of it all. But I know people have jobs, people have lives, people have, you know, all these other things they have to do and not spend time driving around the state looking for specific plants. So the ones I'm going to tell you about are actually pretty easy uh, to locate. I am Lily Browning. I am the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator here in Hernando County. I work for Hernando County Utilities in the Water Conservation Department. Um, my email address, if you are interested in receiving a PDF copy of this PowerPoint or have any other questions for me, um, please email me at lillyb, L-I-L-L-Y-B, two L's in the middle, L-I-L-L-Y-B at hernandocounty.us. Let one more person in, there we go. These are the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping. Everything I teach um, comes back to one or more of these principles in one way or another. Right plant, right place, that's the number one principle. And um, that really does, uh, come into play today, as well as number five, attracting wildlife. Really all of these things usually work together for our Florida friendly yards. So let's talk about, we want to attract pollinators. This is a, uh, you know, pollinator plant starter kit. So when we talk about pollinators, usually what's in our minds are honeybees and butterflies. That is really the top things that we think about um, when we want to attract pollinators. And we really would love those beautiful butterflies adding to the aesthetic value you know, of the garden that we create. Um, but there are many types of pollinators out there and they are all extremely important. By far, the most efficient pollinators, the ones you can truly you know, it's their calling pretty much to pollinate are our bees. The European honeybees that were brought over, um, you know, to um, pollinate crops that the Europeans brought over because for, you know, millennia before they even came, people were, um, you know, knew how to tame those kind of bees and have them in hives and move them around and have them do what they wanted them to do. Because they are social bees, and therefore, um, you know, they're able, humans are more able to use them and put them where they want them to pollinate. But we tend to forget our native bees. We have so many, I think like 400 just in um, Florida, 420 or some native species of bees in Florida. Almost all of them are solitary bees except for your bumblebee. Your bumblebee is another social bee that congregates together. All of the others are solitary. Therefore, that makes them a bit more difficult for humans to um, manage, you know, as far as 
moving them to where they want them to be to do the pollinating of the crops. But native bees are extraordinarily important in our pollinating world. Um, just as important, maybe a little even more so than the European honeybees. So that is uh, letting more people in. That is extremely important to remember both of those types of bees. Wasps are even pollinators. Different birds are pollinators. Uh, butterflies, yes, they add so much beauty um, to our gardens and they are very, very important to the ecosystem. Everything really but the bees are incidental pollinators, meaning they happen to go from flower to flower um, and pollen is stuck to them so that they happen to pollinate. They are incidental pop, uh, pollinators. All of these work together. We need all of these, the butterflies, the moths, even certain beetles, certain flies, certain flies called hoverflies um, masquerade as bees. You may even think they're bees, um, which is a defense you know, mechanism for them. And they are pollinators. So many different types of pollinators. Yes, bats are pollinators as well in different areas, not here in, not here in Central Florida. We don't have any bats that pollinate here. But so when we're thinking about pollinators, let's remember to include everyone who's gonna to come to that pollinating table. The first thing we wanna do when we are prepping for the pollinators, we wanna get the space ready for them is we have to decide no more pesticides because you know it's just not going to work out. Um, Florida Friendly Landscaping, when we talk about um, controlling pests responsibly, we talk about spot treating just the area where you're having trouble, such as you know, treating fire ants with a bait product, just where you're having trouble, not broadcast spreading over your entire lawn, not spraying your entire landscape with you know, who knows what. The less pesticides you have, the more successful of a pollinator garden you will have. They're just not going to um, work together. So, you know, if you still plan on wanting or you have a company or whatever that comes and sprays, you're gonna have to rethink something. You're gonna have to rethink the pesticide that you have put down, or you're gonna have to rethink having a pollinator garden because that's, you know, not, not the best idea to attract them to where they could be in a lot of trouble or even killed. So pesticide free zones, be best if your whole yard was, but you know, maybe just if you know the area where you are starting that pollinator garden for sure. You also um, wanna work towards, and this is a long-term goal. Don't let these ideas overwhelm you. Break it up into little pieces. Remember we're a starter kit. So we're just starting small. But the overall idea is to work for less lawn. This yard was created in a gated community here in Hernando County. I mean, and it took years to get it to this point where um, this lady got it into a beautiful English garden looking uh, type of garden. Then she moved. So I hope <laughs> the new people enjoy it and keep it up as it is. Um, and, but creating these islands of vegetation you see how easy it is in um, this yard for all sorts of critters to um, be able to hide and move from one place to another so that, you know, it's a continuous uh, corridor for them. And she did get her neighbors around her at least to put in some beds like this so that they don't, you know, reach a dead end after they're in her yard. So that is your ultimate goal, less lawn, more islands of vegetation. But again, take it one step at a time. Don't be overwhelmed by it. Also, what you're gonna to wanna to provide is habitat, obviously for these pollinators. What does a habitat include? It includes food. That's gonna be our host plants, 
cover. Doesn't even have to be a host or a nectar plant to provide cover and shelter for our pollinators. Water, some sort of water source and the appropriate amount of space depending on the pollinator and its needs. Um, you can attract the bees and the beetles and the butterflies in even the smallest of spaces. Um, some of the birds, depending on what kind of bird, you may have to, you know, have larger space. That may be why they're not coming, you know, to your balcony or something like that. But we can all provide something for someone. The other thing we want to do is remove invasive plant competition. And go ahead and get mad at me about these um, Mexican petunias. Look, look them up. They are, you know, on the invasive uh, plant species lists by the University of Florida, by the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council that calls themselves something else that I can't remember right now. Um, but, you know, find out what kind of plants you have whether or not they are Florida friendly. You can always, if you don't know, take pictures and email them to me and I'll tell you, yeah, that's okay to leave there. Or yeah, that's that's probably, that's an invasive uh, plant. It's a non-Florida friendly plant. And um, there are sterile varieties of Mexican petunias. I'm not sure how well they've been tested out, but you know, this is just one of the plants that is pretty common that is actually, you know, considered an invasive pest plant. So educate yourself about those, start removing those. That might even be a spot, you know, where you have this invasive plant, you're gonna, this, this actual plant here, not this actual, but this type of plant here um, was planted in my house, the builder put it there. And it literally took me four years of pulling all the roots and tubers to stop it from coming up. But that may be, you know, a targeted area. Look at it, clean it out of the invasive um, plants and start your pollinator plant there. Yes, invasive plants can be pollinator plants. You're, you may see um, insects and birds and butterflies all over them. But that does not mean that they're good for the overall ecology of the overall environment. We have lots of classes on that, and I'm probably going to schedule another one coming up soon because I haven't talked about it in a while. Here's something um, to think about, um, something that I learned um, when we were all quarantined and uh, for COVID and I worked at home for a year. I had a little bit more time to start my own wildflower garden. And what I learned the hard way, because I, I prefer um, mulch, that is the big pine nuggets, but I learned the hard way that that's not necessarily the best when you are looking at a wildflower garden, because the idea of a wildflower garden is to let them go to seed and spread. Well, if they don't have bare dirt to spread on, you could be inhibiting that. And not that that mulch, uh, you know, for very long, helps prevent weeds. I mean, it does to an extent, but believe me, I have plenty of weeds in my wildflower garden, even with, you know, that um, pine nugget mulch. So what I had ended up doing is raking some of it away, like I just created little piles of borders with it so that the wildflower seeds could take hold in the ground. And also I had planted some Sunshine Mimosa, which is a ground cover. And someone told me, well, it can't really latch onto the ground if you put all this mulch in the way. So if you're going to mulch, um, mulch pretty sparingly. And you know what I learned the hard way is you might wanna go with these smaller type pieces of mulch, such as a Melaleuca mulch, um, you know, which is a good environmentally friendly mulch, but it comes in much smaller little chunks and put it on a, you know, a very thin amount. Also, when you um, choose your plants, you want to plant the same plant in mass. So again, don't be overwhelmed by that. What I mean by that is if you want to just start out 
and buy three scarlet salvia and put them like together in one place. Therefore, you know, the pollinators can help find that plant easier. Or and rather than having like a milkweed, <laughs> you want to buy <clears throat> when you start your buying journey, at least get two or three at a time so that you have it all together. That helps the pollinators know where the buffet is and you know, be able to find it to be able to enjoy it. So you want to choose plants, particularly for butterflies that are host plants, such as the milkweed for your monarch butterfly. But you also want nectar plants in the same area. And as I mentioned before, any plant really serves as a good cover plant. So don't worry as long as it's not an invasive pest plant that if it's not, you know, a particular, you don't have to get rid of every plant that it doesn't majorly attract pollinators for consumption because they may use it for cover and for protection. So keep that in mind as well. You see here on this milkweed that I took the picture of, what is right next to that monarch caterpillar there? That's an aphid. They're pretty common on um, milkweed, but it, there wasn't an amount there to really have to worry about. You have to be so careful treating any kind of plants that you have pollinators on. You don't want to put anything, you know, to be able to treat the aphids or anything because it's going to affect the caterpillars. So what you can do there is just if there's a particular stem that is just covered in them, just cut it off and throw those away or you know, pluck those off, try some kind of manual way of dealing with them that is not going to affect the caterpillars. And this is a big one and you wouldn't think that this would really be an issue, but I worked at the county extension for 12 years and it was not unusual for master gardeners to get a call of people complaining that their milkweed, their dill, whatever, caterpillars are eating it all up. What do I do? <laughs> I'll bring out my uh, 80s teenage hood and answer you, duh, <laughs> of course they're eating it all up. That's kind of the whole point. And there is a saying out there that says, if your yard is not chewed up, it's not eco-friendly. <laughs> That's what we have them there for, is to invite guests over so that they have something to eat. If you, you, know, you invited people over to your house and you created a beautiful table, a beautiful setting, are you gonna be upset and put out when they consume that setting that you put out for them and it's no longer as beautiful, of course not. Same thing goes for our butterfly gardens, our caterpillar gardens, our pollinator gardens in general. We put them out there so that things will eat them. So are they gonna be gorgeous all the time? No. Are those plants created to survive these pollinators consuming them. Yes, of course. And not all of them. Some, you know, the bees and stuff are literally just going to move the pollen around. But if we want caterpillars, I mean, let's ask Eric Carley, what are caterpillars? They are very hungry caterpillars, aren't they? So that is what they do. They spend 24 seven eating, <laughs> consuming that energy so that then they can pupate and turn into butterflies so they can lay eggs and start the whole cycle again. Um, I had someone recently, you know, complaining to me that she thought the wrong caterpillar was eating her milkweed and what should she do about it? Um, <laughs> it looked like a milkweed, but she thought it was an imposter. This is what I um, was told. And yeah, okay, it was, it was a, um, I just lost it, you know, not the monarch, but the, it was another butterfly <laughs> that also, you know, has a similar look. You all know what it is. It's just left my mind at this, at this second. 
and also whose caterpillars, you know, consume the milkweed. She actually asked me if she should put some type of insecticide on it. I am hoping she was goading me. <laughs> and you can see my reaction. If, if it was any one of you, I would be a whole lot more patient. So just so you know, she was a relative of mine, hence my lack of patience. <laughs> but um, no, do not spray your, your plants with anything. <laughs> and let whatever, you know, you're gonna get milkweed bugs on some of your milkweed as well. If there's a large amount, try to shake them off, take them off specifically, put them in a, a cup or something of soapy water to get rid of them. Do not spray. <laughs> and just remember, yes, it, it, it's going to be eaten. So let's start talking about some of the plants that are fairly easy to locate, that you won't, really won't have to take long trips you know, across the state or spend a long time researching where you can find them. Some of the places you can find the plants I'm going to mention are local, um, you know, small local nurseries. I'm going to show you a link at the end where you can find out about native nurseries in your area. If you do choose to like make a day trip, maybe to, you know, a couple hours away or something. I'm going to warn you, um, if you live here in Hernando County, don't go looking in Miami for native plants. Don't go up to Tallahassee looking for native plants. Stay in Central Florida. Stay in zone 9A. That is our zone. So going over to Groveland, Claremont, Orlando area, um, Inverness, you know, there's all these Sure, you're safe there, but remember the state is very large and very different. So you get plants native to Miami, you know, probably won't work out for you in our winters here. So with that being said, we do have um, some small native nurseries here. Native plant societies tend to have plant sales. I would seek those out, pretty sure they're done you know, no one's really wanting to have plant sales out in this summer heat. They had them in the spring. Look for them again in October. That's one other area. Native plant societies will start having, you know, pop-up sales. The Hernando County Master Gardeners have a plant nursery here in Brooksville. I'll show you the address at the end of this. And many of these plants you can find there. We do have a um, Spring Hill Garden Club at the Nature Post Botanical Gardens. I can't really speak for the plants that they have, but you know you can go there and seek out to see if they have these particular plants. So there are ways to find these. Caution you about uh, you know your big box stores and the nursery centers. Couple of things. First. Sometimes trying to find native plants there is the saddest, um, you know, search you've ever been on in your saddest scavenger hunt you've ever been on in your life, trying to find native plants. All the others though, you know, if you do find them, ask if they have been treated with any kind of pesticide or if they have a systemic pesticide built in them. Um, I know our Fernando County Master Gardeners rely on biological controls extremely rare that they have to use any kind of pesticide for anything. So that is, you know, going to be very, very important. As I mentioned, if you're attracting pollinators, don't attract them to poison. That's really the easiest way to put it. So this scarlet salvia is one of our native salvias, um, the salvia coccinea. That's our native. Really any kind of sage, any kind of salvia is going, is Florida friendly and is going to attract a multitude of pollinators, hummingbirds, bees, um, moths, <laughs> the hummingbird moths, all these different things. But this red one is your native variety. It's self spreading. Um, you can, you know, there are red, pink, or white flowers. The non native ones, I have them kind of all mixed together. So I have one 
called uh, lipstick um, sage. And it literally is kind of pink and white on the flowers, white with like, you know, pink little edges. Um, I have this very, very dark purple, I call it a black and blue one, of the different kinds of um, sages. My whole front bed is fairly turning into a sage garden. So, you know, and it attracts all kinds of great pollinators. And I got all, all of those plants at the Hernando County Master Gardeners Nursery. Another one that is very successful, especially if you have an area that you think is um, not all that suitable for growing plants. You think it's, you know, a pretty dead area. The speech sunflower will love it. As a matter of fact, um, the speech sunflower used to be my entire front bed that is now the sage garden um, with still some beach sunflower. Why is it not entirely beach sunflower anymore? Because over the years, with the mulch I put in there and enriching the soil by the plants that died in there <laughs> and various things, the soil's too good for the beach sunflower to be happy. <laughs> so you got, you know, look at its name, beach sunflower, uh, dune sunflower. You go to the East Coast, you'll find this all over the beach. They planted it there on the dunes, um, you know, as erosion control and, you know, storm mitigation and all that. The sandier, the, you know, the non-nutrient rich as possible, this beach sunflower will be very, very happy. It'll grow um, as a ground cover, maybe get maybe two feet tall, keep spreading, keep spreading, usually once a year, uh, no, way more than that. <laughs> three or four times a summer, I have to cut it off my sidewalk. Um, that's how much it likes to spread. Um, it will freeze, it'll freeze back in the winter and then it'll come back year after year after year. It's like 14 years now. Like I said, it's not as abundant, but it still keeps coming back. And those little yellow flowers are about the size of a 50 cent piece. It's just, I can't speak highly enough about this very easy plant to have. What it doesn't like, I'll tell you now, is to be transplanted. You can buy it from a nursery in a pot, you know, fully rooted, plant it and it'll do fine. It, it'll spread and all those little shoots wants to grow where those little shoots are. <laughs> I have not had a whole lot of success, not long-term trying to take those little shoots and put them somewhere else in my yard. They're kind of stubborn that way. Firebush, um, really easy to find these days. You have to, if you are very concerned about finding the native, which let me remind you, um, many, many plants can be used for pollination. But if the more you take a plant and move it further away from its original source of being, the less pollinators are gonna recognize it as a plant. So there's a fire bush out there that is non-native. It does not attract near the amount of pollen, pollinators as your Hamelia patens, the native um, fire bush. So that's something you, know, you want to keep an eye out for. Now here in Hernando County, mine freeze, <laughs> freeze to the ground um, every year and come back every year and many different types of butterflies and bees and hummingbirds. I recently, within the past year, retired husband reports to me about the hummingbirds on our fire bush. I don't, haven't got to see them. You know why? Because I'm here with you. So, <laughs> but got to see uh, the sulfur butterflies, love it, um, all sorts of butterflies. So, and this is pretty much one of your you know, guaranteed to be at any native plant <laughs> sale, this fire bush, and um, it can get pretty tall. It can get, depending on where you are, you know, if you're down south, it can get 15 feet tall, like a nice bush, and probably not freeze back. You know, here, um, the one at the Hernando County Extension Office gets 
10 feet tall before it freezes back. Mine I've never gotten over like three or four, but you know what, they all serve a great purpose in um, looking beautiful and attracting all the pollinators. Milkweed. I think I have had the milkweed talk with many of you many, many times, but here's what we will say about milkweed. If you are starting a new pollinator garden, please go for the native milkweeds. You can walk into any big box store and buy your Asclepius cursavaca. That is your tropical milkweed that um, you're used to seeing and has the yellow, red, you know, multicolored in the bunches. There are several problems with that tropical milkweed. It is presenting itself as more and more troublesome <laughs> as the years go by. Number one is um, it's not native to this area, it's native to Mexico. So the monarchs get confused. They think, oh, I already made it to Mexico. <laughs> so they don't move further on in their journey. And what's going to happen here, in, you know, in the winter? Of course, it's gonna, they're gonna freeze. And the monarch should not be up here when we have the freezing weather. They will freeze with it. So that's one of the issues. Another issue is because the monarch, the uh, tropical milkweed does not freeze back you know, or die back. It'll freeze in a hard freeze. It doesn't die back naturally when the um, light changes, you know, when we have shorter daylight hours, your native milkweeds will. They'll shut down production and tell those monarchs move further south, go, go on down there. But um, we've all learned about social distancing and the problems with, you know, congregating when there is a pathogen you can pass around. Well, adult monarchs, all of them have this pathogen that is about that long <laughs> on them. And we call it OA, I believe. OA or OE. Anyway, it is a pathogen on them. And um, well, more like almost like a parasite also. And they can, you know, they can do fine. The adults can. When they congregate, too many of them and don't move along like they should, then it gets passed around more than it would in a natural situation where we didn't put um, you know, non-native milkweeds. So what happens is the caterpillars react, the caterpillars catch this disease, the caterpillars die, or are the butterflies are born deformed and you know can't live that way. So that's another issue with it. Another issue, and you can solve the freezing and, and that issue by cutting it back. If you have it and just cannot force yourself to get rid of it, please cut it back around Thanksgiving and don't let it come back till you know mid-April. Yeah, early April, I'll give you that much. But another thing we're finding is it's becoming an invasive plant. It's, you know, popping up where it shouldn't be. So all of these issues would lead us to decide native milkweed is better, but it's harder to find, but it's becoming easier to find. There are 21 native milkweeds here in Florida. Three have been able to um, be sold commercially, to have been able to be propagated successfully to be able to sell, you know, to a large amount of people. So what is best for people like me who live in um, dry sandy areas is this Asclepius tuberosa. That's the one I have the picture of here. Yes, they're called butterfly weed. Um, that is um, <clears throat> one of the best for us to try and find and grow. And what um, I know the master gardeners here, they actually take trips to a large native nursery in central Florida buy a bunch of things such as, you know, this native type of milkweed and bring it back to resell to us, you know, so that works out well. The Incarnata is pink, 
the perennis is white. Those are both uh, swamp type milkweeds. So if you have a you know fairly wet, moist area, those would be great. The good news is um, horticulturalists are working on, and native plant people are working real hard on some of the other varieties um, to be able to make them more successful in the propagation and the selling process. That's your long story about milkweed. Black Eye Susan, you can pretty much find that anywhere. Again, if you're going to a big box store, ask about their pesticide use in or around it. Um, and that's going to, mine are just doing great. Um, they'll probably die out I'm thinking July-ish or so, but really these are so low maintenance. Some of my other plants are, you know, a bit of divas, want some extra attention. Meanwhile, the black eye Susan just looks at me like, hey, I'm all right over here. I'm doing just fine. So it's another great plant. And you can find seeds for this one. Pretty easy uh, to find. You want to be careful though. <laughs> Do not purchase seeds for Black Eye Susan from Minnesota. Yes, native, but remember we have native ecotypes for our general area. So try and make sure you at least get a Florida native Black Eye Susan. Here's Climbing Aster. This is one in that it is um, going to bring you these beautiful blooms in the fall and the winter. So that is something to help. One of the things you want to do in a pollinator garden is try and have things blooming throughout the year um, so that you know they each take turns being on stage and looking beautiful and providing for the wildlife. So this climbing aster I know is fairly common to find at native plant sales and things like that. Also make friends with native plant people. That is one of the, the best um, tips I can give you. And join the native plant society or just you know make friends with them because a lot of them are out there propagating, they have seeds, they have all these plants they wanna give away. So then you can always be like, hey, look at me, remember I'm your friend. Here's our Florida State wildflower, the chick seed. Um, the seeds are tiny and black, look like ticks. There's nothing about this plant that will attract ticks, so don't worry about that. Coreopsis, there's many different species of Coreopsis. The Leavenworthi is the one that I believe is our state, Florida State wildflower. Even though it has a Kansas name, um, it's indigenous to here as well. Um, and there are several different, um, I think Lancelot, Lancelot, whatever that has to do with the type of leaves that it has, but any kind of tick seed, and you can find seeds for those as well. Any native plant um, sale is going to have them. The master gardeners I know have them. These are just happy little yellow faced flowers that I have growing in the ground, and I have some growing in a pot, and they're just as happy either way. Okay, now, as I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be native. Native is the way to go. That is the ideal way to go. But we also have some non-native plants that are great um, pollinator attractors and that are Florida-friendly plants. Your pentas are uh, one, one example of that. Now, these are not long-lasting. If you get two, three years out of them, you know, you're pretty lucky. You can find them easily in a home and garden center, but remember my rule, ask about the pesticide use. Um, this picture I took at uh, someone's yard and you know we were wondering about that because we had just attended a class that said bees are, don't favor red, they can't see red. Well, something about this penta, <laughs> this bumblebee was uh, pretty attracted to. So, you know, these are fairly easy to find and should get you a good amount of pollinators, at least to get started. I know that um, my church is going, you know, like um, at Easter, a lot of churches buy a lot of lilies and things. Um, someone had the idea, 
especially the red ones that we're getting pentas for Pentecost, which is next Sunday, which I thought was a pretty clever idea as well. Here's another um, non-native that, um, you know, with these brush type uh, flowers, the bottle brush really attracts uh, a lot of pollinators. Uh, make sure though um, that you get um, these two varieties, citrinus or rigidus. Um, rigidus is probably not the weeping kind, that's the upright kind, um, because there is an invasive type. So look that up, look up invasive bottle brush, make sure you don't get that and that you get the right uh, variety of it. Again, easily found in a home and garden center. Ask those questions about it though. Fire spike, um, this one is so easy. Um, I got it years ago when I lived more in the city of Brooksville. I did live in the city of Brooksville. So I had nice clay soil there. And I did what I tell people not to do, which is to, <laughs> to come from a garden center, pretty much dead looking plants. Um, well, they were given to me actually, um, a relative owned that garden center. So I put them in the ground, they grew as happy as can be. Then you could break off pieces, literally just put that piece in the ground and it grew as happy as can be. And these were in the shade and um, hummingbirds were at them all the time because of these, you know, red tubular flowers. So fire spike is another, it's a non-native to think about. It will freeze back and it will come back as well. Coral honeysuckle is a native. It's a vine to think about that also has these red tubular flowers as well. Now here's some freebies for you. Here's some pollinator plants that nature already gave you that you think aren't good enough. <laughs> well, I'm gonna teach you that the pollinators feel that they're plenty good enough. <laughs> so let's talk about these weeds. What we're looking at here on the left is a liar leaf sage. You look at that and you think it's a weed. You know, uh, what my uh, saying is a weed is a matter of opinion. As long as it's not an invasive pest weed, nature put it there probably for a reason. So why, you know, take away um, the free plants that nature gave us that the pollinators are very, very happy with? I think because we got it for free, we tend to think it's not good enough. This one, Spanish needle. Yeah, it's, it's a weed. Yes, it can grow very, very aggressively. Yes, it's going to put those stickers, those hitchhikers all over you. I have some growing in that front bed. That the picture I showed at the beginning, you could see some of it there. What I do is just cut it back where I don't want it to be. I mean, it's a constant job, sure. But you see here, I got two pollinators just in one, one click of the camera. I mean... <laughs> You go out to any Spanish needle where it's growing and I promise you, you're gonna find some pollinators all over it. So this love-hate relationship I have with it, I don't like how aggressive it is. I don't like the stickers that it puts on me, but the pollinators love it. And I, you know, I want a pollinator friendly yard. And if nature is helping me out and giving me this free plant that the pollinators just love, I'm gonna keep it under control but I'm gonna let it be there as well. So, you know, just put it in a place where you're not gonna rub up against it or your dog isn't gonna rub up against it and just let it do its thing. Here's some other uh, um, free plants that look like almost nothing that you would notice until they start to bloom, the spotted bee balm. Uh, horsemint, dotted horsemint is another name for it. It grows wild in my neighborhood. Um, been trying to gather some seeds and see if I can get them to grow in my yard for the specific reason of where I'm getting them from are undeveloped lots, which probably very soon 
to be developed lots the way things are growing in my community. So I'm trying to save some of these. Don't know how successful I'll be, but you can also buy seeds for it. Um, and it's just, it's a really incredible plant. Um, should start blooming for, you know, showing itself in this really cool way that it, that it blooms pretty soon. And the bumblebees are absolutely in love with it. So spotted bee bomb, dotted horse mint, whatever you want to call it. Here's the Latin name for it. Be on the lookout for seeds for those as well. There's another one that grows wild, I think in the spring, you know, in my yard. So I just let it be there. Florida paintbrush, isn't it beautiful? Um, gorgeous, gorgeous purple flowers. And speaking of which, so does this liatris just grow up wild in my yard. Um, this blazing star. You see things like that, just, you know, let them be there. Let them do their thing. The pollinators will thank you for it. Here's another native, um, grows wild around me. Let me tell you something that this goldenrod does not do, does not give you allergies. <laughs> It is an insect populated, pollinated, sorry, plant, not wind pollinated. What goldenrod does is it hangs out in a bad crowd, hangs out uh, with that troublesome ragweed. <laughs> so it gets blamed for the crime that the ragweed committed, but <laughs> The goldenrod did not do it. It does not produce allergies and it is wonderful uh, for the pollinators. So again, probably a free plant. Nature gave it to you. Let's go with it. Here's another one. Now this is a major, major close up of frog fruit. This plant is so cool in lots of ways. One thing is for some reason it has multiple names. <laughs> so, and they're all cool, frog fruit. Bog fruit, turkey tangle frog fruit. It's probably my favorite one, turkey tangle frog fruit. This will grow like a weed in your lawn, most likely. Um, so it is much smaller than it's looking in this picture. Oh, the other name for it, match head weed. You can see where, you know, it looks like little match head. I'm talking the little flower stalks are about that big. And it grows all over my lawn and into some of my beds. I never put it there. But it attracts three different types of little tiny quarter sized butterflies uh, the Phaon Crescent, the Buckeye, and one other little tiny butterfly that it will um, attract. To me, that is so much better than just a monoculture of turf that attracts nothing. And yes, it also creeps into that wildflower bed that I have. So I'm usually in there picking out the weeds I don't want, Bermuda grass, uh, any really kind of the grassy weeds, and trying to leave the weeds that I do want, such as the frog fruit, because it helps, you know, bring even more pollinators to my yard. So, you know, sometimes nature is trying to give us a head start in these things, and we think you're a weed, you're not good enough. Let's get over that attitude and let the weeds help us in our pollinator yards. This one um, grows so many places. Um, I was, I have said before, I haven't seen anyone really selling beauty berry, but I'm going to contradict that in a minute. I don't need to purchase beauty berry because again, nature has given me beauty berry all over my yard. I have originally a half acre and I bought the other half acre next to me so that no one else does. <laughs> and these beauty berries, they pop up all over the place. They make nice little trees, bushes, so easy to transplant. Many of these wild things out there do not respond well to transplants. Beauty berry, American beauty berry, go ahead, transplant it. It does not care. It will be just fine. This is what it looks like right now. 
and it's starting to flower. And they can get pretty tall, you know, nine, 10 feet tall. Um, and they're great because I can move them from when they're where they're growing naturally in the back part of my yard. And they look very attractive. You can prune them and keep them nice looking in the more um, tidy, civilized, you know, uh, part of your yard as well. I just have, you know, growing more and more of them because I'm moving them around and I don't think I've killed one, you know, <laughs> unless it was very, very, very tiny, but you know, it is very easy uh, to transplant and use. And like I said, this is what it looks like right now. They've started leafing out and they're getting these flowers. Some of them are more pink, some of them are more white. And then in uh, the fall, in September, they will have the most beautiful berries, hence their name, very dark purple berries. You know, great uh, bird attractor and very easy plant to plant. The next two are pretty much um, done for the year. They're part of our blue uh, flowers of spring. But again, I, I've seen more and more of this blue-eyed grass lately uh, popping up by itself, which makes me very happy because it is one of my favorite little flowers. It's not a grass. Well, it doesn't have blue eyes and it's not a grass. So I don't understand <laughs> its name at all. Look at that. It's their blue petals and yellow eyes. I'm gonna complain about that forever. But anyway, um, and they pop up in the grass. They're in the orchid family. So I know a couple of years ago, my neighbor who is much more concerned with what his lawn looks like than I am, he had planted some rye grass for the winter and up in the spring popped up all this beautiful blue eyed grass, which made him unhappy because that is not what he intended to be there. And there I was on my knees in his yard saying, look at your beautiful little blue eyed grass. So look for that. If you haven't noticed it, look for it next spring popping up as well as the sky blue lupine. Um, this is one of the things that pops up in the hot, dry, uh, sandy areas where I live. And it looks so out of place because it looks, you know, like some kind of European or Northern type plant. But, and it gets confused with the Texas bluebell. It's in the same family, but this is our native version of it. And um, it's just gorgeous when they, when they come up in the spring. These are very, very, very hard to transplant. They will grow where they decide to grow. So just enjoy them there. There are other plants. Um, if you know none of these struck your fancy is something that you really want. Here's some other ideas. Blanket flower, please get the blanket flower. Even though it was kicked off the native plant team, poor thing. Um, fantastic pollinator plant to use will spread, will come back year after year and look gorgeous. Uh, passion vine, when I have two asterisks here, I am cautioning you against the non-native varieties. So you wanna go with the purple passion vine. All the other passion vines tend to be um, invasive. So be careful with that. Porter weed, again, if you're going for pure native, make sure it is the native variety. Um, marigolds, zinnias, those are your annuals that'll help bring you pollinators, as well as lion's ear, shrimp plant, um, the classic grandma plant, as I call it. Um, swamp sunflower, that's what you see right here. And that is um, great for a fall bloomer as well. Purple cone flower, we all love that one, don't we? Kunti, believe it or not, you don't see a, a single flower on a kunti um, cycad plant, but it is a pollinator um, attractors, particularly in South Florida. Um, there's a particular butterfly that, is, that the kunti is the host for. Bacahatchee grass, and I know our master gardeners have had that in the past. Sunshine mimosa, I have mentioned that as a ground cover. The Hernando County Master Gardeners will probably not have that. They're mad at it. Um, <laughs> where they planted it in their heavy clay soil, it got too out of control for them. My sandy soil, I can't get it really moving, going much at all. But talk to me in five years, I might have another story. I still promote the sunshine, mimosa. 
not the mimosa tree. That is an invasive species. Sunshine mimosa is a ground cover in the sensitive plant family. Oral honeysuckle, which I mentioned before. Firecracker plant, uh, non-native, but has those red tubular flowers. Plant it, forget it. Great plant to have. Yopon hollies, even. They um, are a little native. If you get the dwarf variety, there's several varieties. Some are tall like a tree, some are deep. The dwarf variety have nice little mound looks. So that's just some other ideas for you. If you have a small space, you only have a patio, you know, you're in a villa home, you only have a patio, or you're in an apartment, you only have a balcony, or you're in a mobile home community and um, you don't own the lot, you're not allowed to do anything on it, whatever, how, whatever your situation is. If you live in an RV community and you wanna have some nice plants, Get some pots, put these pollinator plants in the pots. It will still work out for you. You will still have the bees and the butterflies and you will still um, be doing a great service for the environment in general. Here's some of the resources that I um, utilized. I talked about the, um, uh, well, that I would give you this link to uh, the, Associate, Florida Association of Native Nurseries. If you go there, you can find Native Nurseries near you. Some of them require that you call and make an appointment because they're just kind of privately owned or they may be wholesale, but only sometimes, you know, sells retail. So check that out. Um, also, floridawildflowers.org. And there's even a great uh, article that they have, floridawildflowers.org. About, all about pollinators. But from there, you can find out where to purchase seeds and lots of other great information. Also look up the Florida Native Plant Society. There is a Hernando chapter. So go to you know their um, webpage and then look up the Hernando or you can just Google Hernando Florida Native Plant um, Society. And again, do what I do, make friends with those native plant people. <laughs> And as you know, if you have friends who love plants, you're going to have plants too. And of course, the Hernando County Master Gardener Nursery, if you're here in Hernando County, they are located at 19490 Oliver Street. I am um, emphasizing Oliver because there is an Olive Street in, in downtown Brooksville. Now we want to go to the Mimeo Street. <laughs> Oliver Street is near Hernando County Animal Services. Follow Oliver to the very end. You'll be back in, you know, where the nursery is. They are open Wednesdays and Saturdays. They are run totally by volunteers. Um, and right now they're open 8.30 to 11. They will not stretch that to noon again till probably November. And, you know, you, can, you know why. They only want to be out there till 11. So, and here's a, a great uh, blog on pollinators as well. Speaking of the nursery, go back to that, the Master Gardener Nursery. I got a list that Master Gardener Sean gave me. So this is what they currently have as well as others. But he wanted me to know that they have beach sunflower, beach verbena, button sage, cut leaf cone flower, Oblong twin flower, and see, I didn't even mention some of these. Stokes aster, scarlet hibiscus, that's exciting. That's a native hibiscus. Um, and coral honeysuckle, as well as Darrow's blueberry. It's a native blueberry, more for the birds, not for you to eat. Viburnum with lucucci. I don't even know what that is, but it sounds like a very, very local plant, so that's cool. And guess what? they do have beauty berries. So if you do not have access to wild beauty berries, they do have them in pots there for you. Also uh, non-native, they have Roselle, which is cranberry hibiscus, uh, privet senna, and they have the red pentas that I spoke of. 
They also have narrow leaf silk grass, more, um, more natives, narrow leaf yellow tops, tall ironweed, and not native but cool, they have dill, fennel, and triple cured parsley as host plants to the eastern black swallowtail. So that's pretty cool to think. Um, it's too late to go there right now, but you can go there on Saturday. Get there, get there early so you're not too hot either. I have lots of classes on Hernando County Government YouTube. Some other classes that will follow up or expand on what we talked about today include the following. I have one on bee specific, flowers and plants that attract native bees, bird scaping, beneficial bugs, plain pollinators, not the cool kids, but who do just as hard of work. Tiny gardens, big impact. Again, we go back to those container gardens. So if you are in an RV park or a mobile home park or a villa or an apartment, that's a great one to check out. Or you just want to start small and not overwhelm yourself. Again, another one to check out. We have a class on um, gardening for gopher tortoises. Go for it. Pulling in the pollinators as well as weeds or wildflowers, an introduction to overlooked pollinator plants, which I touched on a little bit today. Here are upcoming classes. Um, you won't see me in this format, this 10 o'clock Wednesday format again until the end of the month. Um, and then Carmen Bruno will be joining me on June 29th for recycling inside and out. Um, and we will have a rain barrel class. I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, starting in, well, in July, I will be at the Hernando um, Spring Hill Library to give this class again. So if you know someone who doesn't like to do it online or watch a recording or watch YouTube, send them at 2.30 on July 13th to hear the same class in person. And then um, throughout July, we'll have rain gardens, um, micro irrigation in the landscape. That's gonna be with Dr. Lester on August 3rd. And uh, then I'll be back at the library on August 10th with an in-person class on rain gardens. But don't worry, we will do a virtual class on rain gardens as well. For those interested in rain barrel workshops, my next one will be a virtual rain barrel workshop on June 23rd about via Zoom at six in the evening. You will pick up the barrels the following day at the county extension office. Rain barrels are $64. If you are a customer of Hernando County Utilities, you'll get a $30 credit on your water bill for your first rain barrel. To find more about the rain barrel workshops or if you are interested in a compost bin, we are out of compost bins currently. So we've started a waiting list. So if you want to say, hey, I want to know more about a compost bin, I want to be on that waiting list. Compost bins are free to Hernando County residents only, and you do have to attend the workshop. So email me, lilyb at hernandocounty.us. Um, say, put me on that compost bin workshop and I'll contact you. I've been told there's a PO, <laughs> there's a purchase order for them. So let's um, hope there aren't any shortages in compost bins. Or if you are interested in learning more about the rain barrel workshops, please email me. The answer to any of that is to email me and I'll get into more details. Saturday, there's gonna be an event here in, uh, well, in downtown Brooksville behind our main library branch um, at Fort Dade Avenue, uh, Hurricane Expo. This is for a particular program that'll be there, um, but also um, I will be there. So that will be, if you wanna come meet me, I'll be there, um, bring a fan or a cool drink or something for you too and for me. And um, also who else is gonna be there? Um, they're gonna have a meteorologist panel. So Jeff Berardelli 
from News Channel 8, Mike Clay, he's always there from Bay News 9. He always comes to talk to me about Florida friendly landscaping too. Dave Osterberg uh, from Fox 13. I guess uh, Mr. Delegato can't make it this year, um, but Dave Osterberg is cool too. Dan Noah, Morning Coordination Meteorologist, National Weather Service, Tampa Bay. And Dan Noah is really his name, <laughs> and he'll be there too. And lots of, um, you know, different people to talk to. So especially if you're new here, or even if you're not, want to know more about all the various aspects of um, hurricane season, come out and see us. It'll be from 10 till 2 in the park behind the main library. Here again is my email address. And if you would like a PDF copy of this program, or have any other questions for me, want to talk about rain barrels, compost bins, anything else, um, just email me. And like I said, um, it'll be the end of the month before we have one of these Zoom classes again, but I will be most Thursdays with Dr. Lester at our virtual plant clinic, um, as well as at that uh, Hurricane Expo next Saturday. Thank you everybody and have a great Florida friendly day.